la 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 la. Ooh. That's a whole different color palette on you, Justin. Thank you. I didn't say it was better. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> are we on? Is this thing on, everybody? I believe we are live. <laughs> Welcome to This Week in Science, our pre-show as we get going here. Thank you for waiting as we as we start everything up. Justin had to make some coffee and... Uh, Oh, and he's still playing with the camera. Oh, and of course, my PC decides right now that it's time to restart to install the latest Windows no! updates. No! How do I make that go away? Delay, delay, delay. <laughs> snooze, right? I hit the snooze button. Snooze, go away. I do not want to do that right now. Justin, this is like an 80s music video. Like, you keep... <laughs> <laughs> So like much Joe. fun. So much fun with twists. Woo, 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 woo. <laughs> yeah. Yes. And your microphone. The better will be, camera. The microphone will be good. Is that the better camera? No. You're oh. very yellow. You're yellow orange. This is because he's in Denmark Dang. where there's the cheeses. Yeah. <laughs> 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 I'm not sure you understand the stereotype of this country. <laughs> I think tilt your camera down a little bit. Uh, Too far. No, Hello, Einstein. <laughs> no, well, no, no. Oh, Justin. Boy. You know who's a genius? This guy. <laughs> Troublemaker. <laughs> Starting the show. Why is it telling me? Oh. It, we have a pre show now? Well, <laughs> now we do because of all this. But oh. we are good. We're good to go. We're good. God, to this go. Was so, good. so, why don't we do a show? You, are you let's all ready please. for that? Yeah, yeah, let's start the show. Blair says she has a place to be afterwards. So, we're going to keep keep an eye that. on the clock. I have one question. Do you, Blair and Justin, see the, uh, do you have a um, a, t a clock in the upper? Yes, uh, live in, as of two minutes, 51. So you actually know. Mine says 3.15 on it. Yeah. Okay, interesting. 3.15. Mine says, uh, it's just now three minutes. 305, 306, 307, 308. Yeah, mine says 326, like 327, 328. Very interesting. Wow, we have different timers? Uh-huh. Fascinating. Yeah. I just had to check. I just had to check there. All right, so let's do a show. Now that I know you all can see the clock, I can start actually managing the time on this show better. <laughs> this is going to help me do my job as producer much better. Virtual shin kicks. Boom. Yep. All right, everybody, let us actually start the show. Those viewers out there, you don't need to see the clock. That's for us. That's for me to know. But let's start the show in three, two. This is Twist. This Week in Science, episode number 743, recorded on Wednesday, October 16th, 2019. Science on the Brain. Isn't it always? I'm Dr. Kiki, and today I'm going to fill your head with whispering whales, cool dinosaurs, and brain space. But first... Disclaimer, disclaimer, disclaimer. The world is not always as it appears to be. But more often than not, it's exactly as it appears. The rain falls down from the sky like rain. And the sun shines with the brightness of the sun. The fog was as thick as fog. Sometimes putting all your eggs in one basket is just an efficient way of collecting eggs. And while not every wasteland is vast, there are some modest wastelands out there, a rose can be as red as a rose wherever red roses are found. Still, there are some places in the world where you can find things as they are and still be full of surprises. The world of dumpster diving or keeping with the theme of the show, the world of science. 
finding the world as it is, describing it as you find it without analogy, simile, or cliche exaggeration can be more inspiring than a poetic interpretation of unicorns and heat. Science is the art of revealing a thing as it is. And in the spirit of such things, we bring you a show about this week's science news that we call This Week in Science, coming up next. Good science to you, Kiki and Blair. And a good science to you, too, Justin, Blair, and everyone out there. Welcome to another episode of This Week in Science. We're back again to talk about science, all the fun stuff that was in the news for the last week. Oh, my goodness, and there was a bunch of brain news. So our show is packed to the gills, no, to the skulls with brains. Packed to the skull, (laughs) interior skull wall. That's right. <laughs> oh, yeah. I have stories this week about some some good energy. I'm bringing, I'm bringing this show some good energy, man. I've got the cool dinosaurs that were mentioned just a couple seconds ago and brain news. <laughs> Go figure. Justin, what'd you bring? I've got Neanderthals via GNC, uh, case for brain space, unnerving concussions, and aerobic activity. Activity for obese longevity. Very good. And moving into the animal corner, Blair, what is there? I have ancient mammals and I have whispering whales and I have whispering very, whales. very smart pigs. Do you have a whole farm full of very smart pigs or is this? If like- only. Oh, Blair on the farm. It's like, it's like her idea of heaven. Pigs are great. Guys. Pigs are Just great. Be- wait until we get into the corner. But honestly, pigs are great. <laughs> and I know many people like pigs for various reasons. Silence. All right, let's get into the show. <laughs> I want to remind everyone, you, if you are not subscribed to This Week in Science online, you can find us as a podcast, all the great podcast portals that you that there are, iTunes, Google wherever, Spotify, Pandora, Radio.com, TuneIn, wherever. You can find us there. We're also on YouTube and we're on Facebook. Look for This Week in Science or just visit twist.org for information. And at twist.org, that's also where you can find a link to pre-order our 2020 Blair's Animal Corner annual calendar. It's available right now, so get in there. Go to twist.org. And pre-order yourself a calendar or one for your friends. The holidays are coming up. Okay. You guys ready for some good energy? Yes. Yes. Let's go to get some good energy. Yes. I was looking through the news this week and there were a couple of stories that caught my eye because they were just kind of that, that happy vibe. There's the bad vibes all the time when we're thinking about climate and where things are going. But this week, there are two articles on Ars Technica that report really good news in the energy efficiency front and renewable energies. So wind farms are finally coming to the fore in the United Kingdom. And according to a new analysis, the group called Carbon Brief, they have determined that this year, that this summer... Uh, wind production that this renewable generation of energy surpassed fossil fuels for the first time in the United Kingdom. So because of wind energy coming online, they estimated that renewables produced 29.5 terawatt hours of energy in July, August, and September. Fossil fuels only produced 29.1 terawatt hours. And carbon emissions were even better with the UK 
starting to drive down coal-fired generation, which is leading to a decrease in its emissions of those carbon emissions, right? Nice. Less coal, yeah. less carbon, less pollution, more renewables, and there are more wind, there's more wind generation and wave generation coming online in the UK in the near future. 12 megawatt turbines are now being produced in Europe. So each tower, wind tower, can produce more energy. Uh, and the wave, wave power is a big deal. Here in the United States, we want to, you know, come closer to home to where our podcast is being produced. Here in the United States... A report is out, a new a new paper is out that this year the United States green economy growth is just completely outpacing the fossil fuel industry, even without the subsidies that the fossil fuel industry gets. The study estimates that revenue in the global green economy was $7.87 trillion in 2016. At $1.3 trillion, the, the U.S. made up 16.5% of the global market. And that in the green energy economy, uh, there was uh, the supply chains and the number of people employed in these areas, the green economy is employing nearly 10 times more people than the fossil fuel industry at this point. It's almost uh, 10 million to one, which is very exciting. America, uh, the, the energy policy that has been put forward by Trump was going to bring fossil fuels into the fore, but it seems as though even without that plan and with uh, with sustainable investments and the growth of uh, of renewable energy and also the reduction of coal energy here in the United States as well, we're starting to really ramp up. In 2017, uh, China emerged as a global leader. It has plans to event, invest three, $361 billion in clean energy by 2020 to generate 13 million jobs. Mm-hmm. A lot of news is coming out about China and uh, the work they're doing is they're another massive emitter on the global scale. And there are a lot of other countries that are currently, they're, they're gnawing at the bit to overtake the United States as, uh, as green economies and as produce, producing clean energy. Unless, of course, things like the Green New Deal get uh get more yeah. traction but we will see where that goes and and what ends up happening um so so as uh as i'm currently uh broadcasting from denmark i think i should yes. probably point out denmark has more than uh 40 percent of its electricity comes from wind yes is uh, denmark and, very windy <laughs> it can actually can be pretty windy so uh, uh right uh, but one of the interesting things is you'll see these sort of giant wind turbines uh, there's a, a gorgeous uh, array of them out sort of at sea uh, in the North Sea. But there, you'll sort of see them pop up in strange places. Uh, I was at a mega Ikea store uh, a couple of days ago. That sounds very fun. And there's a giant uh, wind You just got that... back, right? It was two days ago. You just <laughs> no, made no, it through. It really was. No, yeah. it really kind of was. It was like, you go in, <laughs> you have like the three things, and then it's a half a day later. And you're still wandering around, piling things in. Like I don't know how to get out, but I need this lamp. Uh, uh, <laughs> <laughs> but but they, they had a big wind turbine with an IKEA logo on it, and I, I was kind of wondering if they had sponsored it in some way, or if it's because it's on their property they got to put. No, that giant wind turbine is powering this giant uh, IKEA store, and so oh, there's cool. uh, there's not just a a sort of governmental uh, push to do these sort of things, but it's being taken up by industry and, and companies saying, yeah, let me, we, we're going to build this giant mega store. Let's keep it off the grid as much as possible. Uh, but, so it's, it's, it is a thing that really, and it's economical and like you pointing out, the whole idea with coal jobs has been a misnomer for, for you know, decades because it was automation that eliminated those jobs and has nothing to, less to do with the energy shift uh, and there's much more jobs available in the green economy than there are. And it's growing. 
And it's growing. It's only and it's going growing. To grow. Yeah. Absolutely. Well, and, and this is what we want, right? We want the the right choice to be the easy choice. It took mm -hmm. some early oh. adopters to do a lot of yes. extra work to pay more, to struggle to find infrastructure to do what needed to be done to make things more efficient, more acceptable, mm -hmm. more um, available. But it's getting to that point now where the scale is tipping, and green energy is the wise choice from all angles, which is ultimately what we want. <laughs> Yeah, let's keep it going. And I, I hope that we'll be able to report on all sorts of new advances moving forward in, you know, in turbines and photovoltaics and batteries and all of these technologies that chemical and mechanical advancements are going to allow them to become more and more efficient and better at producing that energy for us. Now, let's talk about super efficient. What's super efficient? The human brain. Of course. <laughs> the human brain is super efficient. But you know, there's this weird thing about humans. We mature when we're young. We, we, we mature really slowly. It takes a long time for this peak efficiency organ to get to the point where it's actually doing the stuff that we recognize with, you know, people stuff, right? the cognitive work of being a person mm -hmm. takes a long time to get there. And so there are these questions about what are the differences in the human brain versus our closest relatives, say, not, not exactly closest, but chimpanzees, some mm -hmm. of the closest animals to us on the planet. What are the differences in our development versus theirs? Because chimpanzees, they do develop more quickly they i mean they kind of have to but this is a this is something when did it happen in human history and why did did we suddenly have this long developmental period so researchers publishing this week in nature have uh, been working with brain organoids and now these organoids are you know little collections of stem cells that have been allowed to grow and turn into a very mini tiny version of a brain it's not an entire brain but it's got multiple cell types it's got multiple layers that I, I just kind of imagine them as cute little brains in a dish <laughs> I'm imagining you know those gummy um, fake hamburgers a little gummy brain <laughs> There we go. It's not exactly, neither of us have the exact uh, description of what they look like, but these little mini, these mini brains as they are, as they are nicknamed, allow researchers to grow something that approximates the real organ without actually having to grow a whole brain or for that matter, a whole individual. And so they made these cerebral organoids from chimpanzees and humans and then compared the genetic signature over the developmental period to figure out what exactly was going on that was different. And they did find that there's no difference in the organoids in how they look between the chimpanzees and the humans. But the genes behave completely differently. And the behavior of the genes changes over time. And the chimpanzee organoids, they say, grew up more quickly than the human organoids. So even in a dish, the chimpanzee little mini brains were, were getting older faster. Taken at the same time point, samples of the cells, these neurons, Chimpanzee neurons were more mature than the human neurons, and they had a profile of their gene behavior that is what you would recognize later on in older human brain cells. Interesting. And so it's, there's a lag that happens in, in human brain neuron development. They're, they really are not aging as quickly. The genes that are turning on to create changes that lead to those d structural and functional changes that occur that allow cognitive thought are they're happening at different phases of time so compared to compared to each other these timelines are are very different and they they may explain a lot and beyond the the actual timing differences they found that there were Differences in the DNA, for sure. Some stretches of DNA are not present in humans that are still present in chimpanzees and other primates. 
And those stretches of DNA seemed to be influential over the behavior of other, of other genes. And so these were kind of control centers that maybe are activating some of those early, th those genes early. And since humans don't have it, they don't get turned on as quickly. So what happened maybe to, so that humans lost it? And why was that adaptive is a big question. So these little mini brains, uh, they're telling us a little bit. They haven't told us everything yet, but we're learning that there are these similarities, there are these differences, and maybe eventually peering into them a little bit more will tell us more about our evolutionary history. How we got to be human! I love the idea that it just it's, uh, we gained this superior intelligence by being slow. Yeah. Yeah. It's just, <laughs> just it, takes, it takes us a while longer than the rest of you apes. But when we get where we're heading, then it's fantastic. Yeah. Are we sure that we're slower and not that chimpanzees evolved to develop faster? Because we're looking at these two ends of a, a forked road. We're not looking at a common ancestor. Yeah, but if, right. you, if you leave the common ancestor, uh, and this is a direct comparison, and you look towards the rest of the animal kingdom, uh, that's sort of the thing with animals, is you de de the young develop very quickly so that they can go fend for themselves. In and, some cases, not in we, all cases. Well, in most cases, come on now. What, what no, there's, there's altricial and precocial young. That's a whole, those are two completely different strategies of development. And yeah. one is an animal that's ready to go. And one is an animal that needs coddling. And if you look at an animal like um, most rodents or even an opossum, they when they only yeah. live a very short amount of time, if you look at the amount of time they're dependent on their mother, it's actually a huge percentage of their lifespan. That's interesting weird. Yeah, but yeah, chimpanzees, even though they're dependent on their mother, very similar to humans, it's for less time. Right. So they're yeah, everything I, I is can't picture it, any animal in the wild that it. has 12-year-olds toddling <laughs> around behind. Well, an eight-year-old gorilla is pretty similar to an eight-year-old human. Oh. Yeah. Hmm. Very playful, not good at reading the room. Not good at reading. No. <laughs> So there's definitely, there's, there's certain yeah. relationships that are similar, but at a certain point, at least with gorillas, as my example here, I'll follow it through. There's a moment when it kicks into high gear way before it would for humans. That being said, gorillas don't live nearly as long as humans. Right. So what, if you're looking at it, is it that they speed up all of a sudden or is, is it proportional to their length? Their, their, Relative to life their yeah, lifespan. lifespan? There is some interesting questions there. Yeah. But anyway, we're getting at these gene regulatory features mm -hmm. that are really unique to humans and uh, differentiate us from the other ape mm -hmm. groups, which is pretty cool. Tell us more about ourselves. So, Justin, so then, then, oh, yeah. it's going to move on to the next story. I just had, a, okay, but I just had a thought that it would be a trade off. If we could slow down, uh, that cognitive development, could we extend our life uh, times? Could, we, could that uh, lend itself to longevity? Uh, is this of, is this why m m more people are living at home with their parents longer now? Something will live to be 120. <laughs> yeah. Well, I'm going to yeah. go ahead as the it's person who wants easier. to live forever on the show and say, <laughs> no. not worth it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I was dumb long enough. <laughs> I cannot yeah. wait to be an adult and have more knowledge and be a functioning human. Uh, I don't know, Blair. Functioning, functioning yeah. humans, <laughs> this has nothing to do with functioning humans. The Aegean Sea uh, is the most storied sea, I would say, of them all. Uh, and as far as seas go, it's probably one of the most beautiful seas that you could ever uh, view. Uh, and in the, the, in the sea of stories, that there are, there are picturesque islands with white sand beaches and clear azure waters that you can see down to the bottoms of. It's just kind of gorgeous. There is, uh, amongst these, an island that mythology might attribute to the birthplace of a god, the island of Naxos. The child Zeus 
is rumored to have run barefoot through the caves along the beaches here. Uh, so it's the ideal scene, iconic everything ancient Greeks held sacred in this spot. And it turns out that uh, while the, the history of how the Greeks came to inhabit the islands uh, between sort of Turkey and eventually Greece is maybe even more interesting than the mythologies that they came up with uh, later. They weren't the first to settle there, apparently. Uh, not by a long shot, in fact. An international research team led by scientists from McMaster University has unearthed evidence that the island of Naxos, which in the Aegean Sea, it's you got Greece over somewhere, and then you, as you make your way towards Turkey, there's a whole bunch of islands out there. In the sea. Uh, this is sort of closer to Turkey than it is actually Greece. Um, and they found that Naxos was inhabited by Neanderthals and earlier humans, uh, and inhabited back over the last 200,000 years. Somewhat stunning find. Uh, findings are published in Science Advances, and they've gone through years of excavations uh, to sort of do these determinations and find. They're finding, oh, what was that? Hundreds of thousands of tools, stone tools, hunting weapons. Uh, this is this is not just a, there were some Neanderthals uh, or early humans that stopped by and then moved on. This was inhabited for quite some time to have amassed this number of tools. The authors are suggesting that the Aegean Basin was uh, perhaps more accessible than earlier believed. One of the, one of the beliefs has been that this, this stretch, because it's, these are islands, uh, the only way that they could have been populated is by somewhat modern humans. The, the number is usually back around 9,000 years for these islands. Um, a little further back than that, perhaps 11,000 years range for these islands to be populated because what was required to get to these islands? Boats. Boats. You had to have sea craft <laughs> enabled to get out to you. These were not walkable or swimmable islands. You needed it. So... Two possible theories. Uh, one is that during an ice age, there could have been a lot more islands accessible by foot than previously thought, which also brings up an interesting thing. You know, one of the, the, the oldest sites of somewhat modern human, at least, uh, evidence is, is Mor uh, Morocco, the north coast of Africa, is some of uh, the oldest and most recent technologies in stone tool development. Modern humans were finding lots and lots there. This is the sort of the neighborhood. Uh, so if it was walkable or as they're pointing out, perhaps boats were <laughs> developed much earlier and perhaps even Neanderthals 200,000 years ago might still have required uh, some sort of seagoing craft. You had a raft a log that's a float on, or a very ornately built boat. We have no idea uh, because, unfortunately, one of the things that's really hard to preserve in the archaeological record uh, in the Mediterranean is wood. It's right. too warm. So we find we find some. Sometimes we'll find an ancient Viking boat or something like this uh, in higher ledges where the the sea is very cold and perhaps the deterioration is rapid but in the Aegean eh, yeah wood doesn't hold up too well so we have hundreds of thousands of stone tools 200,000 years of habitation on just this one little island and sort of rewriting one of the out of Africa passages because this opens up not just the sort of land bridges uh, that we are used to considering uh, <clears throat> migration of humans but actually that humans may have taken to the sea and Neanderthals as well. Although with the Neanderthals, they may have actually been coming back down towards that, Africa. That's so fascinating because, yeah, we just think of the land bridges and the walking. and But the idea that early humans could have been fashioning some kind of, I don't know, boat structures, lashing logs together in some way. Like this is... 
Wow. If we could if we could actually have some record of that, that'd be pretty amazing. And so and so this is Neanderthals 200,000 years ago. Neanderthals 800 a million years in in Europe spreading out across yeah. uh, Asia. Uh, what's sort of interesting is this would be a almost back to Africa story for Neanderthals getting this close. Yeah. This is, you know, the, the off the north coast of of Africa here. Uh that's awfully close for Neanderthals who have, you know, to, to become. So then, so then you have to start thinking, is there another graded stream where Neanderthals made it back to Africa at some point? Because this is so close. Or is this, or are we looking at, because we don't have a fossil, right? We just have uh, tools and implements and this sort of thing at this point, uh, for the most part, to look at. So... Yeah. yeah, I wonder how much more time. I mean, we've got evidence that, you know, the Neanderthals, they're, they're down in Spain and humans were mixing. Like we've talked about that just a few months ago. They're, they're down in Spain. Humans and Neanderthals were probably mixing in that region of Southern Europe for a very long time. I mean, that's so close to this area in Greece. Yeah. It seems as though that there's every possibility that that backward flow could have happened. And the genetic diversity that we see, why would it have all happened now that we're talking about this kind of movement of people, of individuals through areas, why wouldn't that be represented in the genetic diversity that we and, have currently? And it means that we may need some more ancient human DNA to compare yeah. with too, because what we've com compared with what's uh, Neanderthal DNA and what's uh, modern human DNA is maybe contaminated if there wasn't even earlier admixture before the uh, before the later. However, um, yeah. one of the things that I just uh, just clicked in, we did a story about uh, an island near Crete uh, that had Neanderthal evidence. Mm -hmm. uh, that at that point they had determined there's no way you could have swam there, even with the ice ages they believed it was. Uh, it wouldn't have even been visible, let alone swimmable. Uh, so there's, there's mounting evidence Neanderthals might have had boats or flotation devices of some sort to get from one place to another. Uh, they may have been, as we keep finding, more advanced than we allow ourselves to give them credit for. And then really, uh, you know, what's a boat? It's just something that floats. I mean, as, as Wall Street Tech options. in the U but as Wall Street Tech in the YouTube chat room calls it, is what's a boat? A great big log. Yeah, That's exactly. So that. there are animals that exist on islands, and the only way we can seem to figure out that they possibly got there was they, they floated there float. on a piece of wood. Yeah, yeah they, they basically yeah, just okay. floated. So, yes, exactly to that point, it could just be a piece of wood. Although, it would have happened. Although, uh, I will say, though, it wouldn't have been necessarily just accidentally floating there and ending up there. It turns out that like this particular island has the the perfect uh, sort of rocks for making uh, stone tools. So if you were if you were an ancient stone tool making society, you would come to this island and go, "Oh my gosh, we have a plethora of resources. We don't have to go foraging for the right stone tool. They're everywhere. We have everything we need." to have a society well i mean like they could go with a purpose but just use a log and then paddle then you're basically just surfing right you're like paddling out to the surf there could be yeah. ancient surfers that got you know used their yeah, yeah. i i think i would i because they could at least they had the stone <laughs> tools i like the idea that they were crafting uh at the very minimum surfboards surfboard yeah <laughs> <There you go. laughs> very minimum very minimum I mean, oh. what other conclusion could you draw? <laughs> I don't know. Surfboards. All right. Maybe not the take home message. <laughs> Sorry. Take home. Yeah. Um, moving on. Is it time to move into Blair's Animal Corner? With Blair? She loves our creatures, great and small. Biped, milliped, no pet at all. If you want to hear about animals, she's your girl. Except for giant pandas and squirrels. And I'm no more. What you got, Blair? Oh my goodness, this seems very apropos um, based on our previous conversation we just had. So I am going to have to tell you about the first ever 
observation of pigs using tools. What? Yes. Which, um, if a Neanderthal can make a boat, a a pig can perhaps make a shovel. Um, So this was a accidental discovery looking at a zoo in Paris. A researcher happened to see a pig using a stick to dig a pit. Now, when, when I first tell you that, and when I first read it, you might be picturing just a pig kind of pushing a stick around, um, and that could be an accident. It could be them playing, but no. I'm hoping that Kiki will play this video in a second. You can actually see the pig pick up the stick with their mouth and shovel with it. It is very clearly them using this tool. So I'm going to narrate for the, the audio Um, audience here audio audience so picking up the stick moving with it now using the stick to actually she's still repositioning or she i should say she's going to pick it up and actually dig like a spoon or a shovel it's pretty crazy um see there might be more videos but so they saw this they thought it was a fluke right um But then they started to test in other spaces. There she goes. Check that out. Um, They appeared to be digging a nest to house their offspring. Um, Over the course of three years, they observed 11 instances of the pigs using tools. All but one individual were female. They also gave the pigs spatulas to see if they'd use a different type of tool. Those are used twice, but overall, they really just wanted to use the sticks. That's what they were used to. Um, they, they, they say it's not clear why the pigs were using these tools, because as far as the researchers could tell, it didn't seem to give them an advantage in digging the, the pits. I would hmm. say, based on what I saw in the video, based on very little, but just based on what I know about animals, <laughs> I would say if I was a pig, I would want to use the tool so I didn't get dirt up my nose. That would be beneficial. Yeah. So that's my theory. Um, But so this was totally an accident, only observed in captive pigs. So there's all these asterisks. It was only 11 instances over three years. But once again, it's time to mention, okay, crows use tools. We talk about it all the time. Otters use Mm -hmm. tools to crack open food. Elephants move rocks and logs to cover watering holes. Uh, We've talked on the show about bats using particular types of grass to amplify their calls. I'm not surprised to hear that pigs, as a very intelligent animal, might use a tool. I'm not surprised either. Mm -hmm. I think I I am surprised. What I, I, I do find interesting is that the spatulas were really not not made use of. Yeah. But maybe they were a less efficient tool. Maybe they weren't as good. Right. Maybe they'd be like, oh, I'll try it. No, that didn't work. That's, yeah. These people don't know what they're trying to offer us. Well, and we don't know if they modeled using it for that that mm-hmm. before they handed it to them because this might be something that's passed amongst mm-hmm. individuals. And so if they mm-hmm. don't see somebody doing that, they might not know to use it for that. So there's lots going on. I feel like further study is needed. But yeah, I'd love to know if it is the kind of thing where, say, uh, like ducks and geese, they have the uh, they have instinctual behavior to reach out and at the nest they'll bring an egg in to back to the nest if an mm-hmm. if an egg has rolled out of the nest, right? Mm-hmm. If uh, but if that egg is not an egg, just a square white object, the 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 goose will try and pull that back into the nest. Mm-hmm. It doesn't mm-hmm. differentiate whether or not it's an egg or not an egg. It just right. has this action to bring the thing back to the nest that it thinks it has lost. And if this is part of their nest building behavior in these pigs, is there some kind of uh, instinctual mm-hmm. behavior in the construction of that nest. How are the how yeah. are the nests uh-huh. built? What are the features of the nest that become important to the pigs? Right. You know, there are a lot of variables maybe at play that we that haven't even been looked at. Absolutely, yeah. I mean, yeah. this is definitely the tip of the iceberg. But pigs are smart, and uh, further study. Uh, the next study, further study I want to mention here is from University of Chicago. 
And it's interesting. I would love to get <laughs> Kiki and Justin your thoughts on this. Uh, this is looking at the history of mammals and their habits of being awake during the day or at night. We are, of course, are diurnal. We are awake during the day in most cases. Mm -hmm. uh, but this is actually the exception as opposed to the rule in mammals. Um, most mammals, if you look around, are nocturnal. And we all have some common ancestors that were nocturnal. Around 250 to 230 million years ago, the mammalian ancestors called therapsids became exclusively nocturnal and stayed nocturnal until the dinosaurs disappeared around six, 66 million years ago. So you could say that humans are a species that have reverted back to living in, in the day, as opposed to um, that being the status quo. Now, the traditional argument, which would make sense based on the timing of all this, is that they were nocturnal to hide from all of the predatory dinosaurs, be so that their schedule didn't sync up, so that there it was easier for them to hide and then forage um, during the nighttime when there were less dinosaurs out and about. And then once all of the dinosaurs were gone, they were able to come out into the light. But this new paper, Obligatory Nocturnalism in Triassic Archaic Mammals, Preservation of Sperm Quality? Question mark? Huh? has another idea. <laughs> yes. So therapsids were becoming rapidly endothermic. They were um, being able to control their own body temperature internally. And that's through a metabolism, right? And so um, that means that over this period of time, their body, their internal resting body temperature was going up. And as they got smaller in the Triassic, you started to see their their body temperature going higher and higher and higher, up to around 93 degrees Fahrenheit. Still a lot lower than we're used to, but still pretty high compared to an ectothermic animal where their uh, body temperature will take uh, dips and, and peaks kind of throughout the day. Mm -hmm. So um, th because they have this higher body temperature, they would not be able to offload excessive heat generated by being active without losing a bunch of body water by sweating, panting, etc. Right. Um, so they would want to be awake at night so they wouldn't lose all this um, this water that is, you know, a valuable resource when you're trying to survive. But the other side of this is that archaic mammals did not have scrotums, and the reason that mammals have scrotums is to keep sperm away from this high body temperature mm -hmm. is to keep them from getting too hot and basically going bad. <laughs> so um, when sperm is too hot, it uh, messes with the quality. It messes with the, the proteins kind of in the sperm. It can uh, cause the accumulation of free radicals, all this kind of stuff. So the scrotum is what keeps sperm from being too hot and, and basically spoiling before it can do its job. Right. Um, so if they didn't have that yet, there was no way to keep sperm cool. So if they're having this constant higher internal body temperature and they're awake during the day, this is a big problem. But because they're active at night, they were able to observe, uh, preserve sperm quality more effectively in this kind of transition period. So this is this new theory, is that it has nothing to do with the dinosaurs and hiding from predators. It's all about sperm. It's all about the sperm. Yes. <laughs> Because wow. they had to cool down. Uh -huh. they, the therapsids had to stay cool and cool their sperm. Yes. So, and, and amazingly, that uh, system can adjust itself, uh, self adjust to keep warm as well. Absolutely. Yes. Pretty brilliant. Yes. So, if you think about it, it really is quite an amazing adaptation. Mm -hmm. uh, to solve this kind of interesting problem. But in the meantime, this is this new theory is that they, these animals actually completely changed their lifestyle to preserve sperm. <laughs> but if so, right. It's okay. Great. But wouldn't 
everything would be harder at night. I mean, be, I mean, you're completely nocturnal. So then all of your mating habits, is that, is that at night? Does that make it harder to find a mate? Is that something that is, uh, I mean, maybe that's why many of our ancestors did, decided to be, you know, they, let's be mammals and let's have a scrotum <laughs> so we can enjoy the day. Yeah. <laughs> so we can enjoy the day. <laughs> but the, so another big question here is, I mean, this is without any evidence of the actual therapsid sperm. We don't know Correct. <laughs> what temperatures caused it to denature or have issues. We have no clue. Correct. <laughs> this is, if you ask me, wild speculation. <laughs> and I do think it makes, it's just, you know, it's, Often the, the most obvious answer is the right one when it comes to this sort of thing. And it just does seem like getting eaten by a dinosaur is more of a pressing threat than having some birth defects in your babies because your sperm was too hot. Like one thing is your evolutionary line is done. You got eaten. Yeah. It's over. The other is your sperm's not as effective. <laughs> so... I feel like out of the two, the the theory about avoiding dinosaurs and and surviving potential predation is is making more sense to me. But I like this idea. You know, it doesn't have to be one or the other. There could be right. multiple benefits. So this right. could be a benefit. I'm with that. That makes sense to me. Sure. So things, I mean, maybe... mammals were much more diverse than I think we tend to give them credit for in the dinosaur days. So I'm not convinced that we were all nocturnal all the time either. Like that's right. Yeah. I mean, that's the conventional wisdom is that the common ancestor, the therapsid ancestor, was nocturnal. Yeah. So yeah. the understanding there is that even if every mammal that was around at the beginning of mammals happening wasn't nocturnal, the ancestor was. So therefore you kind of have this, this root in that. But. Nocturnal root, where did it come from? I think there is a, uh, a graduate student thesis in here. Somebody yeah. who wants to do population dynamics of being eaten versus by dinosaurs versus um, having your sperm get hot. Yes, I love it. I so, wonder if you could. I wonder if you could do computer modeling and population dynamics of these two possible routes and determine which would be better. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I don't know. I'm sure yeah. maybe. I'm sure there's, maybe there's a grad student out there who wants to have fun. <laughs> yeah. We will see. We like having fun. We love having fun here on the show with science and. Right now, we are going to take a break. It is time for that part in the show where we take a quick break. We are going to be coming back in just a little while, though, just a couple of minutes. We will be back with, oh, my goodness, cool dinosaurs, more cool dinosaurs, not, ther not therapsids, but dinosaurs, and lots of brain stories. We'll be back in just a few with more This Week in Science. Explain things you've heard with more than intuition. A line of reason shows the way to go. Thank you for joining us for another episode of This Week in Science. We are so glad that you decided to spend your time learning about science and uh, having some fun at the same time. We have our this Week in Science, Blair's Animal Corner calendar available for pre-order at the moment. So if you want to get your hands on a 2020 calendar full of amazing art by Blair, she's made 12 animals from her style, her art style of choice for this year, which is a stained glass look. The calendars are, uh, she said, all the art is now done. So we are almost ready to start going to production, but we can't go, go to production if you don't order them, right? We don't want a whole backlog of things, so we do a bunch of pre-ordering every year. Go to twist.org, click on the 
frog. Click on the Twist 2020 calendar image. Pre-order your 2020 calendar right now and get one for yourself. Maybe buy one for a friend or a loved one who needs a calendar for next year. It's, there's, you can always start learning. Get them in time for the holidays or get them in time for the new year. I cannot believe I am talking about the new year already. Oh, Blair's sharing her screen. I don't even know what to do with this right now. This is new tech technologies. Here's some pictures of some art. I haven't played with this yet. Woohoo! Some pretty art from Blair. As Blair is showing you these wonderful images of the art for the 2020 calendar, which looks amazing, by the way. I cannot wait to see this calendar produced, Blair. So much bright color. It's going to be wonderful. We also, at our website, you can also click on our Patreon link to support us in a monthly ongoing fashion, or you can click on our Zazzle link for other Twist products. You can also click on the subscribe link to find Google, YouTube, or the Apple, Play, Apple Store uh, subscription links. Nice and easy for you for an ease of subscribing to This Week in Science if you have not subscribed yet yet. This Week in Science is listener supported right now. So all that you are able to do helps us do this show for you and for us to grow. Uh, we would love your help telling your friends about Twists. Right? Tell your friends, bring your friends and family into the Twist family, and we will all have science fun together and grow together. Maybe we can even do more together. And with that... Oh, what am I supposed to say? What am I supposed to say? Thank you very much for your support. We really could not do it without you. We can't explain the things you've heard with more than intuition. A line of reason shows the way and we're back you're listening to this week in science we are back we're back with more this week in science and now it is time for that segment of the show that we love to call this week in what has science done for me lately, lately. Taking it up there. This week, I have a wonderful letter from Jacob Evans. Jacob wrote in to say, Hi, Twist crew. I have a contribution for what has science done for me lately. I started collecting and enjoying houseplants around my home earlier this year. The spring and summer were different from usual in that anecdotally, my own seasonal allergies and those of my kids were dramatically reduced to the point of only being thought of a few days rather than weeks of puffy eyes and runny noses. Whether it's the plants filtering contaminants or the soil containing somehow beneficial microbes, like the ones you guys discussed about people in rural environments in a May episode, I can't do more than speculate on. But what I can say is that through a variety of scientific pursuits, from botany to aviation to computers that run the, nurs the nursery's inventory and ordering, I've been able to enjoy foliage from around the world without leaving my little corner. From the peace lily of Southeast Asia to the monstera of cent Central America to the prayer plant which moves its leaves daily following the sun from Brazil, all without leaving my Sacramento apartment. Thank you for science. Thank you, science, for fueling my curiosity and my hobby. Thank you for sharing, Jacob. This is a wonderful, wonderful reminder that the plants around us can remind us about the science that makes our lives possible. I, I thought I love those examples as well. These international examples of foliage of flowers that have these different behaviors, these different looks. And they come from different areas of the world, and they have so much to teach us. Maybe, maybe they decontaminate the air, but yeah, we're not so sure about that. Maybe. No. That's one of those stories. Or maybe just seen. having plants nearby make you less sensitive to other plants. <laughs> yeah. Maybe that's what it is. It's maybe like the uh, you're like eating cat hair. 
<laughs> yes. Sure. <laughs> yeah, just habituate you. <laughs> It'll just habituate you to the plants. Yeah, I don't know how well that works in a seriously a serious allergy situation, but yeah. Jacob, thank you for writing in and everyone out there, remember we need you to write in so that we can keep doing this segment of the show. What has science done for you lately? Give it a little thought. You don't have to write us a long letter, a short note, or uh, a little tweet. Well, not a tweet because I don't really check the ones on Twitter. I can't remember all the different places. You have to send me an email, whatever little format you decide. An email's good. Kirsten, K-I-R-S-T-E-N at thisweekinscience.com or facebook.com. Our Facebook page is This Week in Science. Leave us a message. If you're watching us on Facebook right now, you could think about this and maybe just leave us a message while you're there. That could be good. Anyway, we want to keep doing this with a something from you continuing into the future. Justin. Oh, yes. Tell me a story. Okay. See if I've got one here. Ah, so we've been talking about the human brain as being this amazing organ. It is actually the all-star celebrity organ within human anatomy. Uh, it is housed in a shell of skull. It feeds on blood and sensory input, floating like a whale in an above-ground backyard swimming pool. It's uh, three times the size of our nearest evolutionary ape cousin. And the human brain is not without its admirers, among them anthropologists at the University of Zurich, who in a recent study show that changes in the brain occurred independent of evolutionary rearrangements in the brain case. So we've, hmm. we've been talking about this yeah. uh, off and on for a while on the show about uh, the development of the brain, skull sizes, how we, we have seen that they can actually grow and shrink uh, brain sizes can sort of uh, change over time. That it's not just a linear increasing in brain throughout uh, hominin history, and and throughout uh, you know even in apes. So this is finding that the relationship between brain and brain case, how they interacted during human evolution, uh, is sort of not necessarily completely related to each other. Uh, the researchers were looking at uh, brain and brain case relationship in our species versus great apes. They qualified spatial relationships between the cranial structures and the brain. This is uh, Jose uh, Luis Alatore Warren, who used computed uh, tomography, tomography, CT, yeah. and magnetic resonance imaging, MRI, data from humans and chimpanzees. Pansies. They combined the CT and MRI data and was able to quantify the spatial relationships between brain structure, the uh, convolutions and furrows. I can't, what is it? Gyri? So, what is this? Yeah, the, sol words? the sulci and gyri. Gyri and sulci on one hand uh, versus the cranial structures and bony structures on the interior of the skull. Results show that the characteristic spatial relationship between brain and bone structures in humans are clearly distinct uh, to those in chimp chimpanzees. While the brain and its case continue to evolve side by side, they took different paths. For example, brain structures related to complex cognitive tasks, such as language, social cognition, manual dexterity, expanded significantly in human evolution. And this becomes visible as a shift uh, from the neural and anatomical boundaries of the frontal lobe of the brain. This shift, however, did not affect the bony structures of the brain case. Instead, they're saying the changes in the brain case largely reflected the adaptations to walking upright on two legs. Bipedalism hmm. uh, is more to, uh, was more influential on the, the bony structure in the interior of the brain than the brain's development. Now, we can sort of then kind of argue whether or not the brain was following uh, uh, the, the new structure that it was finding itself in, right? Uh, the, the ability to sort of use space that may not have been there before or fill in. Uh, for, but for example, here, the opening of the skull of the base for the spinal cord moved forward 
as we uh, evolve to be bipedal to optimize balance of this right. bulky head at the top <laughs> of the uh, vertebrae column. Um, but yeah, they say the, the changes to that brain case did not have an effect on the, on the stru cerebral structures themselves. So uh, this is a summary from uh, Dr. Warren. The brain followed its own evolutionary path of neural innovation while freely floating in the brain case. The position and size of the brain case bones thus don't enable us to draw conclusions about evolution, uh, evolutionary changes in the size or rearrangement of adjacent brain regions. Hmm. And this sort of ties really into then uh, to the study that we covered some time ago about how bipedalism may have also been part of a mechanical pumping of mm -hmm. the feet pushing blood to the brain case. You've got also then the positioning of the skull now for balance. You get this the opening moving forward, which is allowing more blood flow. Because as we know, uh, the brain is three times larger, but the blood flow is like, uh, is it six and a half times more? Uh, or even even greater than that. It's like maybe even a magnitude greater. The blood flow yeah. to the brain is incredibly larger than you see in any of the other uh, apes. So it may uh, it may be creating another argument for not just that mechanical action of running, pumping blood to the brain case, but the actual just needing to balance uh, better while being bipedal opened up more space for arteries to move blood to the brain. I, it's 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 a chicken or the egg kind of kind of argument all of a sudden you know it, it, we kind of said well the brain must have changed and of course the brain case changed along with it and now this idea that it didn't it's a it's a really interesting it's, it's an interesting thought to try oh. and go through how how it would have affected it over time it's 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 neat I, I like Although this I, idea I do have to point out uh, for the chicken and the egg the egg came first. There were eggs before there were chickens, so there was an egg, and then maybe a chicken came out of it, but there was always an egg Metaphorical, first. metaphorical chicken and the egg. I, I hear what you say, but the answer is egg. Egg came first. There were eggs yeah. way before there were chickens. It's a real Neanderthal boat situation, is what we're saying. There we go. Which came first? We don't know. We don't know. We're gonna switch it around from now yeah. on. There's no longer we can't we can't have chicken or egg any longer. It's now a Neanderthal or boat. Yeah. And, and 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 just just to just to knock down one more uh, apples and oranges, very similar, very similar, almost Truth. almost indistinguishable when when trying to show two things as having almost everything in common. It's... <laughs> uh <-huh. laughs> we need to so... clean up our analogies, people. That's all I'm saying. This has been Justin's idiom corner. Please continue. <laughs> uh, moving on from old humans and apes and brain evolution. I'm going to take us back to the cool to idea of the cool dinosaurs, but it's still using an interesting technology that uh, the computed tomography, CT tomography. And Blair, do you remember a little while back you reported the story about T-Rex and mm -hmm. the odd space that they thought a muscle wrapped around and they were trying to figure out whether this this spot in the head was for the heavy the big jaws and the strength of the jaws and they realized oh it's like it's a sinus for cooling down the yeah. brain and cooling down the blood in the head well this study that was just published in the uh, in anatomical record expands on the work that w that you reported on and expands the work to several different groups of dinosaurs that the lead researcher at this uh, in Ohio University's Heritage College of Osteopathic Medicine um, looked at. So um, Ruger Porter, he's assistant, prof assistant professor of anatomical instruction, lead author of the study. He said the brain and sense organs like the eye are very sensitive to temperature in animals today. We have these elaborate thermoregulatory strategies to protect these tissues by shuttling hot and cool blood around various networks of blood vessels. And we wanted to see if dinosaurs were doing the same thing. So they looked at long-necked sauropods, 
armored an- ankylosaurs and the T Rexes. They looked at several different groups and used the CT, the uh, computed tomography uh, imaging to look at the insides of the skulls and figure out where the blood vessels went. And in looking at the different groups, what they pretty much found is that different dinosaurs had different kinds of cooling strategies, depending on what what their heads were like. So they didn't all have the very same strategy to cool cool their jets, so to speak. So the ankylosaur, for example, I'm going to guess, did not do evaporative cooling through their brain because they are covered in armor. <laughs> we'll, we'll get to that in a second. Okay. Yeah. So, <laughs> so first we have the, uh, the long-necked Diplodocus, the sauropod dinosaurs. They had really long necks. Their heads were, stay- were very far away from their bodies. And so the bodies might be hot, but their, ne- their head could stay cooler. And a lot of them had blood vessels in the nose and mouth that actually did that shuttling of cooled blood so that that air evaporation in the mouth um, could have been used to cool blood in the whole nasal region, in that whole, the front of that, of their face. And and an interesting um, point by one of the researchers is brought up, you can imagine sauropods hanging out with their mouths open, using their open mouths to help them cool off on hot days. So maybe the sauropods, they're hanging out, they got their feet in the water, but their mouths are open like hot <laughs> birds. Sometimes you see birds that are too hot yeah. and they keep their beaks open um, for, you, for that. You know point. what this is doing? This is because <laughs> of the story that Blair did earlier. It's it's making me uh, realize that the the head of, of most creatures is basically a scrotum for the brain. Uh-huh. There you go. Yeah, there you a go. Way to, a way to get it away from the rest of the heat of the body. <laughs> and to keep to keep the brain cool, uh, it's, it's it's you know what it's it's just a, a lucky bit of evolution that we we don't have our brains and hanging from a fleshy sack. <laughs> I'm glad my brain uh-huh. is not hanging. Our brains are really important. But maybe that's a reason why. But yeah, thank goodness they're not just. Hanging. Or it could be the other way around. We could have little scrotum skulls. I mean, those were the those were the models that didn't make it very far. Yeah, <laughs> natural selection. Yeah. Uh, so, so now the, the the sauropods, you can see they used their mouths and their nasal sinus for the cooling of the blood that would then go to the brain. The ankylosaurs, they have like the armored plating, but their heads, their necks are shorter and they're much closer to uh, their body. But the uh, the ankylosaurs only emphasize the nose. I mean, I don't know that there's a, a, a necessary reason for that, but the uh, they say smaller, the body size might be a big factor. Smaller dinosaurs, like the goat-sized Pachycephalosaurus stegosaurus, had a balanced vascular pattern without a single cooling region that's overemphasized compared to other regions. Um, and the researchers say that smaller dinosaurs didn't have an overheating problem like bigger dinosaurs did. So mm-hmm. these big dinosaurs had to deal with cooling their brain down in this in this really interesting way. And they, what they call it is an unbalanced vascular pattern. And so this unbalanced vascular pattern allows these different thermal strategies to focus on one or another or multiple cooling regions. And so the sauropods had that mouth and nasal region. Ankylosaurs that they looked at seemed to just have the nasal region. And the the theropods, like the T-Rex, they were saying that those were the different outlier, that they had the big air sinus in their snouts and they had that uh that evidence that you reported on blair that this uh, that that air sinus actually had a bunch of blood vessels in it mm-hmm. um that re- that created a different cooling area for these theropod dinosaurs and so the um the the fun here though is that uh we find that these dinosaurs they all had different solutions to uh similar a similar problem. They had to 
they they had to cool their heads. Um, and they their the heads I guess are not scrotums. Mm -mm. <laughs> Thanks for that now forever, Justin. But you know, you there's in a Venn diagram, there's things in common. I understand what Justin's saying. There are things in common for sure. So yeah, dinosaurs. They they cooled their heads. Big dinosaurs. They were working. They had to do that. Justin, tell me another brainy story. Well, it's handy that our brains are not just encased in a fleshy sack, uh, perhaps, uh, because uh, brain trauma could be much more common if we didn't have this thick uh, outer skull to protect it. But that thick outer skull that protects our brain also is kind of the source of damage to the brain. So in traumatic brain injuries, what's usually happened or in the case of like a, something like a concussion is the brain case, the skull stops very rapidly by encountering another uh, object that doesn't want to be moved. And the brain continues in its floating whale in a backyard above ground pool to move over and hit the side. Uh, and this is the brain damage that takes place uh, during a concussion. So it's been believed that the, the lasting effects that come from uh, uh, a brain injury like this are, is nerve damage to the brain uh, is the lasting effects. And so things like uh, we've talked about, the, the, you know, considering things like a CBD uh, that reduces inflammation and can help rebuild neural network activities uh, might be beneficial. The, the research that uh, uh, was just done here by Cold Spring Harbor Laboratory, Professor uh, Partha Mitra, uh, finds actually that they found much greater signs of blood vessel damage than nerve damage after performing post-mortem mm -hmm. scans on injured brains. So what they're saying, is, oh, this I'll just go Cody voice here. Nerve damage following traumatic brain injuries has been a majority point of view and therapy as well as drug development has been targeted towards that. The idea that if the mechanism is actually different, therapeutic intervention may also be different. So they found considerable blood vessel damage uh, surrounding lesions where the trauma left physical imprints on the brain. They used, a uh, uh, team used iron stain, which shows up blue in the presence of blood and a myelin stain for the presence of nerve fiber fragments on the brain samples and saw significant amount of the iron marked blood cells across the area where the lesion was located, indicating traumatic microbleeds caused by ruptures along the blood vessel across the brain. Uh, they did not observe any significant nerve damage from their stains. So in this, though, there is a little bit of a caveat uh, that uh, they point out that their setup was better designed for viewing the blood vessel damage than the nerve damage. So they uh, you know, might be uh, slightly underreporting the nerve damage that was present because mm -hmm. of the fidelity. They're just not their seeing ability. it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it, so that it's not it's not ruling out that there isn't nerve damage that they that, that that's not a thing that that's not a problem that's not an issue. Um, they they wholeheartedly admit in their paper that this is the 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 way that this is designed. It was looking for a contrast and didn't maybe pick up all of the nerve damage as well as it was picking up the vascular damage. However, showing that uh, significant vascular damage in the microbleeding. Uh, does then shift some of this uh, focus towards figuring out how to perhaps stop bleeding in, in a brain right after an image uh, as a priority over something that would be beneficial to preserving nerves. So reducing inflammation, yes, but also wanting to stop microbleeding in the brain, which, uh, Different, uh, different approach, different focus, but this is uh, fantastic that they have uh, they've 
delved into this and made this, this discovery. It seems like one of those things that, gosh, with all the, the sports medicine that we have, uh, <laughs> Yeah. You know, we should have uh, be much further ahead in concussions than we are. Uh, ahead. Than, ahead. Than to pun it. But, <laughs> um, but I, I actually have to blame I, the, the one source of concussions I think of more than any other that's it's in the media. I mean, it's, concussions come from everywhere. They can come in, in uh, wartime battle uh, situations. They can come on the sports field uh, in football with helmets banging into each other. They can come between you and your partner, both reaching for a napkin that fell off a table at the same time. Like Cracking they can your come hands together. Lots of different yep. places. Mm -hmm. uh, but I tend to think of it in terms of football because it's now a, a real important aspect that's being focused on in injuries uh, on the field. Uh, and, and it had been ignored for so long by professional sports that had they taken it seriously earlier, we'd probably be a lot further along because uh, sports medicine drives a lot of what becomes physical therapy uh, in this country because there's, there's so much money and- yeah. They have resources for sure. Yeah, there's the resources there to, to focus mm -hmm. heavily on it. So, so uh, but yeah, it seems as though, and it feels like the attitude of professional sports having changed and focused on concussions as a real critical thing to address to preserve their sport, I think is part of it too. Publicity yeah. uh, is is probably pushing a lot more research in this in this direction. So. I'm sure I'm sure you're right there. I'm sure it is pushing a lot of research, but it it I hope what it does is it uh, pushes treatments so that we have ways. I mean, the brain is virtually inaccessible unless you put a hole in the skull um, you know it's really hard to get to to help it so th the question is what can you do after an injury to enable healing to reduce the impacts of the inflammation to reduce the impacts of those microbleeds that we're talking about like how can this research now that they're seeing these microbleeds are potentially a big issue in addition to the nerve damage and inflammation how can we put that into a bigger picture of treatment therapy healing? Yeah. And funny you should say this. Uh, this is another story that I didn't bring. Uh, <laughs> just because it sounds too much like a pre-trial pharmaceutical thing. Uh, but there is, uh, there is a drug uh, that is out in, I think it's a UK study. I'm not really bringing this story. But it is specifically for, it wasn't for concussions, but it was, it was designed for people who were in like car accidents and that sort of a thing mm -hmm. uh, to, to reduce bleeding uh, right af after uh, uh, a traumatic brain injury. And, and it was showing some good signs of doing it. But interestingly, cool. it, it, interestingly it's, uh, it's working to stop the, the bleeding in the brain. Now, what, that, what doesn't, what isn't part of that story, part of also why I didn't bring this is it's very preliminary. Also, it doesn't talk about long-term damage. It's talking about, okay, this is something you do to save somebody from internal bleeding in the brain right after an accident. Um, as a concussion protocol, it may actually do more damage than good. We have no idea. You don't know. Uh, yeah. But there are, there is, uh, like you said, ways of g getting to the brain and stopping this without drilling the holes. Uh, that is something that is from your mouth to yesterday's uh uh research uh it, we're slightly behind the cutting, edge, at, even at the yeah. cutting edge yeah mm -hmm. <laughs> speaking of cutting edge i think we all need to get some rest Ooh. okay good night no that's not what i mean oh, okay sorry that's that's not what i mean <laughs> <laughs> what i do mean is that it turns out from a new study that is in Nature this week that a particular compound, a, a, a signaling molecule in the brain called REST, R-E-S-T, may be responsible for how long you live. This new study found out that the amount of REST that's in your brain may influence the amount that your brain is excited or stimulated during your life and that as you age your, the amount of rest in your brain decreases leading to more excitation and stimulation in the brain and that can lead to earlier death so basically 
people, they looked at centenarians and the brains of centenarians. They looked at um, older individuals, looked at their brains and found the older individuals had way more rest in their brains than younger individuals. Then they looked at fruit flies and they looked at mice that they genetically modified to not have rest and they manipulated how much rest these model organisms had and found that really the amount of rest influenced activity or activation of neurons in the brain, not activity in the brain, but activation of neurons in the brain, excitement versus inhibition. And the ones that got more rest lived longer. So now, what does this mean for us? Okay. There's Nothing two... really. Yeah. We don't know. <laughs> so, so there's two things. There's two things. It either means that a rested brain uh, will allow for greater longevity. It could also mean that overusing your brain will make you die young. <laughs> But that's so so this is where it comes in when I'm, I'm trying to use the, the right words here, because it's not when I say activation or activity of your it's not how much you're using your brain, because we know already that using your brain that exercise all these same things that you would think of as act, act, activating, they're good for your brain and actually help to reduce dementia and help you live longer and healthier. So it's not about rest. <laughs> it is about the uh, level of stimulation that the neurons get at the level of, uh, of the cell membrane and the ions that pass across the cell membrane. This rest molecule is involved in uh, a chain of signaling pathways that, um, that can influence the moderation of how much stimulation, how many ions can pass a membrane at any point in time. And so you might think of it, um, and I'll have a, I'll, a, my next story quickly after this is going to be one about epilepsy. And you might think of the epileptic brain. There are neurons in the epileptic brain in some regions that are always ready to be excited. And when they, and so they're hyper excited. And when they, they get over a certain, uh, a certain threshold, then an epileptic seizure can take place because all of them get over excited at the same time. Um, but if their threshold level were brought down somehow, then that the, the threshold of jumping to a seizure potentially wouldn't occur. Yeah, uh, there are thoughts like this along, uh, along for migraine as well. Um, and so what's interesting here is that this has to do with like the general health of the neurons and that the, the, if you think of neurons, neurons are not just wires in your brain. They're living cells. Each neuron is a living cell that has metabolic processes going on inside of it. When these neurons do get stimulated to increase their activity, that means that they have to start making a bunch of things inside of themselves to send little molecules to other cells and do and so different functions start to happen and so if that happens too much that can potentially have a deleterious effect on the cells over time um but anyway there's a lot of questions as to what in fact is going on here uh, we don't know much about this cascade that stems from rest at this point, other than it seems to be involved in longevity. People who uh, live longer lives, their brains have more rest. Uh, but this this signaling cascade does seem to be tied into certain behaviors, certain things that we've looked into, like calorie restriction, uh, that also seem to affect longevity as well so this might they all might be tied in together uh to to the way that cell metabolism takes place and how these cells how these cells function so anyway maybe someday we'll all just be like hey i'm getting old i need some rest and rest one more time stands for <laughs> 
<laughs> Sorry. So, yeah, I did not say what rest stands for. Rest. I didn't say what rest stands for. It's just the, it's a, a it's a, just an, an, a protein okay. called rest. And it does sound stand for something, but I don't know what the full name of the protein actually is off of hand, offhand. Mm. Do you want me to go find it? I'll go find no, it. No, it's right okay. Now. I was... <laughs> it was just it's, it's transcription R transcription R E S T. Factor, yes. Okay. Mm hmm Okay. It's a transcription factor. There you go. Yeah. R E one silencing transcription factor. R E one silencing transcription factor. Thank you, Blair, for looking that up. You're welcome. Thank you, Google. <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying to do too many things at once. I didn't do it ahead of time. Um, yeah, but then moving uh, to a really quick, quick story here that was published in Science Translational Medicine. Uh, some other researchers were looking at epileptic brains, researchers at Stanford University School of Medicine, and they found that the uh, this activity in neurons in epileptic brains in the areas that uh, from which the seizures get started that are seizure prone, there is a, uh, a type of signal, an electrical buzz, so to speak, in the area. It's called a high frequency oscillation. And these high frequency oscillations can occur all the time, even when epileptic uh, epilepsy patients are on medication. And they discovered that when they were looking at the electrical activity of the brain, they were able to see another uh, see another kind of activity get disrupted by these high frequency oscillations. So they they took patients and they stuck little receivers in their brains to record activity. And they then tried to get the patients to think about something, to remember something, to do something that took a determined cognitive, cognitive effort that would create one specific kind of measurable brain pattern. And if within several hundred milliseconds, a high frequency oscillation happened in a, a before a seizure-prone brain region started processing the information, the question that had been asked for them, the accuracy of the patients or even just their ability to process and perform the, the cognitive task was completely disruptive, disrupted. And so what they are thinking moving forward is instead of looking at potential medications to treat epilepsy moving forward, maybe we can start looking at the uh, the brain activity moving forward. And they have um, they have actually moved forward in uh, licensing a file for a provisional patent on a device and plantable device that can be put in patients brain brains to distinguish between the high frequency oscillations and regular oscillations and disrupt them so that epileptic, epilepsy patients would be able to continue functioning and not have to deal with any medication, which could be pretty cool. I mean, you don't necessarily want to put something in your brain, but at the same time, if it can disrupt some major seizures that are causing you uh, life-disrupting trauma, then it could be cool. Yeah. It, yeah. It could be cool. Uh, my final story for the show is, hey, scientists have made a vaccine for cats. But no, when, not when you say for cats. <laughs> <laughs> I mean it in multiple ways. Okay. Um, a study published in the Journal of Allergy and Clinical Immunology uh, from a group a group called Hypocat, they have published results on a vaccine that is given to cats for them to fight a naturally produced protein called FEL-D1 so that they become less allergic to people who aller are allergic to cats. Wait, wait, whoa, 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 whoa. So this doesn't make the cat the person who's allergic to cats less allergic to cats. This makes cats 
less allergic to people who are allergic to cats? No, it, nice. it makes them make less allergens, right? There you go, no. Claire. Okay, yes, yes. It oh, makes yes. them make less allergens. My question is, might this be linked to something else that the cat actually needs? Just curious. <laughs> Apparently, in the study, it did not uh, cause an issue with the cats, um, and it was it, it seemed to work. Uh, it doesn't desensitize the immune system of people allergic to cats. It goes the other way, trains the immune system of cats to go after FELD1 so that it, they no longer produce the allergen anymore. The cats developed an immune response to the allergen. Booster shot kept antibody levels high. Uh, FELD1 seemed to be neutralized in the lab, and the cats produced less of it in their saliva and their tears, which means they're putting less of it onto their beautiful fur, um, which would turn into then not become danner. So cats would not be allergic. And when the cat samples were mixed with blood taken from human patients, there was less of an allergic reaction. So uh, the vaccine did not appear to cause any side effects or at least no serious or long-term side effects in the cat. But Feldy one apparently has no critical function in cats that we have found so far. Yeah, that we know of, yeah. Well, we know yeah of. Cats serve no critical function. As it oh. is. We, this is not part of the story. <laughs> uh, but yeah, they are looking at potentially going ahead with this cat allergen vaccine trying to get it to the market by 2022 so it's an interesting sort of uh thing though because i i suppose if you have a family member or something that's allergic to cats so cat allergy is very uh it's a big deal thing. it's yeah. a very serious thing uh people can walk into a house where a cat lives and their tongue can swell up and they can no longer breathe and might need to go to a hospital. It can be so severe. Or they can um, hang out with their friend who has a cat at home in a completely other location and start to have a response. Yeah. As yeah. Well. So, but what, what then I think is like, yes, uh, I have this friend or family member who, I, who, who can never come over because they will die for my cat. So I'll give my cat this thing. Not get rid of the cat. Right? But just give the cat a thing so they'll become less. But it's also like then somebody who's like, I've always been allergic to cats. The cats terrify me because they might kill me if I'm around one. Ah, but now finally there's a, something I can give a cat so then I can have a cat. No, you're not. Those people don't want cats. They want. They have no, there are nothing. Some people do who are allergic to cats who have mm -hmm. always wanted a cat. That is a there thing. Are. It is a thing. Don't tell me that some people... Just because they don't know better. <laughs> this is just okay. you and your biases, Justin. Yeah, sure. Well, speaking of pets, I have a very silly story about pets, um, and specifically dog food and how owners measure out their dog kibble. Uh, this is a study that was done <laughs> where they took 100 dog owners, asked them to use one of three common measuring devices to measure out kibble, a standard two-cup scoop, with markings, um, a two cup liquid measuring cup and a one cup plastic dry food measuring cup. Um, on average, people had underestimations, 48% under to 152% overestimations on their food. It was all over the map. Um, of course, the worst one was trying to measure anything smaller than two cups with a two cup liquid measuring cup shocking um and the best option was to measure with a dry food measurement in the exact size you needed huh but really the gold standard would be to measure by weight which makes sense that's what we do at zoos for um dietary reasons with our animals we weigh out all of the dry food that we give to animals this is exactly why because there's variables when you use scoops um, but ultimately, this is just a proof in the way measuring tools work, is what I I'm think, seeing here. I think this needs to be nominated for an Ig Nobel next <laughs> year so oh for discovering God. that people have no idea how to use measuring implements. Yeah. Well, <laughs> even just that certain measuring implements are good for certain things. A liquid measuring cup is good for measuring, huh, liquid. Liquid. <laughs> Not kibble. 
shocking. Anyway, so that was a very silly story. Um, and then I just want to finish up with the whispering um, whales, the teased whispering whales, whispering female whales. Atlantic right whales whisper to their young to avoid eavesdropping predators. Yes, scientists suction cupped microphones to whales in the wild. Um, and they actually found that in a typical right whale call that you could hear them from about a kilometer away. But when they had a young baby, their speech would only be audible at a range of around 100 meters or so. And they think that that 10 times reduction in uh, the range of that sound is to avoid them from being heard by predators. Wow. Mm -hmm. Clever whales. Mm -hmm. That's clever. And they never would have known if they hadn't gotten up close and stuck a suction cup to the whales to yeah, really right. hear them. Suction cups on whales because science. Mm. <laughs> because Oh, wasn't there something else about whales? The large whales this last week that, that came out? The whales... Um, uh, oh, yeah, that whales are responsible for um, for more carbon, like putting more carbon back into the oceans than, uh, like, than trees are for mm. for carbon on land or something. It's really uh -huh. interesting. Yeah, it's really, like yeah. whales are a carbon sink? Is that what you're saying? Whales are a carbon sink that is more, is better than trees. Oh, oh yes. yes. Look at that. I found yeah. it. Wait, yeah. so, so is that one whale versus one tree or is that all whales versus all trees? Like, what's... More like all whales versus all trees. It's an overall wow. generalization. Um, but the idea is that because uh, they, because of what they put into the their waste going down, and then also it fosters phytoplankton, even though that's one of their big food sources. It's all, they, they have an entire ecosystem that pretty much follows them around that is more impactful, <laughs> almost in total than uh, than trees. And so, if we just save the whales, we would have potentially a more a, a larger impact on. Um, on our atmosphere than by planting like a billion trees. So two things that I saw just looking this up. It's qu um, some questionable it's things. stored in their fat, which mm. is pretty cool. Um, and when whale a whale falls. dies and its carcass descends to the bottom of the sea, that stored carbon is taken out of the atmospheric cycle for hundreds to thousands of years. A literal carbon sink. Haha, <laughs> very funny. But it's a lot of that carbon is probably going to end up in the ocean, which also is an issue. So that's a whole nother thing. But um, just a good reminder that all uh, living things have a role. And so when you remove anything, you don't know what you're doing necessarily. There's all sorts of impacts. And this is just another one. Yeah. All right, Justin. Ah, so uh, this, is, uh, this is a story about elite athletes. Uh, it says here, overall, elite athletes are at a decreased risk of death from cardiovascular problems. Makes sense, yes? However, there is a certain group of athletes that have a higher risk than the general population of cardiovascular problems, and those are uh, American football linemen, which also makes sense. So uh, if you've uh, never watched the sport of football, I will only describe one aspect. And uh, there's a, a line of uh, guys on one side and a line of other guys on the other side, and who are going to smash into each other at the beginning of every play. And their average weight is probably over 300 pounds. Uh, these, these are big guys. These are really big humans, uh, weight-wise and, and in height-wise in many cases. And so this is a, a study in JAMA cardiology that is tying the increased risk uh, of cardiovascular problems to rapid weight gain players undergo during early training. Um, this is one of those strange athletic things where it actually is very beneficial to have more weight. It's essential in the role. Uh, when you are going to be an offensive or even a defensive lineman, outside of the physical training, learning a playbook, practicing, your main job is to eat. Uh, to gain weight and to maintain that weight for your career. Uh, what's also interesting is, so, well, anyway, in this study, they uh, 
they uh, they went through and looked how Division One college levels and above uh, are putting on all of this weight to fill these roles in these athletic things, and they get things like high blood pressure, sleep apnea. They can also develop thick, uh, stiff heart and arteries. Um, so one of the things that they also discovered is that if you do aerobic exercise, you can reduce a number of the complications uh, that are associated with this risk. So as long as, and then they're of course saying that they can apply this then to people who are not athletes, but simply have a uh, larger weight to them than the average population and might be at more risk for cardiovascular disease than the general population. It, it is one thing that uh, that's also interesting is this is, you know, if, if, if one, any one of us is like, okay, so in order to do next week's episode of twist properly, we all need to gain 40 pounds a piece. In that a would, week? Yeah. Or, what? Oh, no. No, by the end of the year, we all need to oh. put on 40 pounds. Okay. Yeah. Give us some time. We can, then we have Thanksgiving and Christmas. It won't be that hard. Uh, you know, it's, it's a pretty dramatic shift. And one of the things that when you look at these players, you might just assume these are naturally big people. Uh, you know, it's great that a 300 pound athletic person has a role in an athletic event because in a lot of sports that, you know, being 300 plus pounds might not be beneficial, not good for the high jump, uh, not good for, you know, running the bases, maybe. There's a lot of things where this wouldn't. But these, this is part of a training regiment that gets a lot of these guys to this weight. One of my favorites is a, a, a center for the Indianapolis Colts who retired. His name was Jeff Saturday. So, you know, he's a center. He's right in the middle of the line of these big guys. Always a really big guy for his, his – like a year after he retired, he's like my size. Like he just didn't have to eat as his job anymore. Uh, it wasn't required for him, he, the weight just vanished. He wasn't genetically predisposed. This was actually a physical training thing. So one of the things that this study is, is revealing is for those people to maintain health while they're going through this professional decision uh, to maintain these really high body weights is to spend a, a certain amount of time doing aerobic activity to sort of oh counteract uh, and of course, then you can translate to the general population of even if this isn't about uh, you aren't able to lose the weight or this isn't the focus of the exercise as a weight loss thing. Mm -hmm. uh, maintaining high aerobic activity, exercising your heart and your cardiovascular system uh, will reduce the ill effects that are normally associated uh, with that greater weight. This makes sense, too, because sumo wrestlers, they are known to have no like they have no cardiovascular issues while they're because they're, they're putting in 7000 calories a day. Sometimes these sumo wrestlers have to be like 400 pounds at least. And they are they're they're massive, but they train constantly. They have a very heavy training regimen and it's it's constant. It's just the way that they live their lives. And apparently when I was just looking at another article uh, while you were talking about that, they um after they retire, have to cut back their eating because they stop their training regimen. And if they keep eating at that rate, oh, they yeah. die at a 10% higher rate than the rest of the population of cardiovascular issues. It's like everything catches up with them all of a sudden if they don't keep up with the exercise. Yeah. So I think what you're saying here is is exactly right. And now they're putting it into this, this, uh, this new situation of football players or we can like you said put it into everybody's life if you're gonna eat you gotta balance it out just generally <laughs> take care of your heart move that's, that's what yeah. this is about yeah and they blame uh the sumo stuff on its visceral fat so the fat that wraps around your organs as opposed to the fat that just gets put underneath your skin there's different mm -hmm. kinds of fat and if you have lots of the visceral fat which can, uh, yeah, that's the stuff that causes the hardening of the arteries and a lot of the other issues. Yeah. Pretty cool. Pretty cool. Work it out, everybody. <gasps> We've come to the end of another episode, haven't we? We did it. Did we do it? We did it. We did it. 
for another episode. Thank you, everyone, for joining us. Thank you for sticking with us through our romp of science. I would love to give shout outs to a few people before we go. Shout outs to Gord McLeod for helping to manage our chat room. Thank you for that. Identity Four, thank you for recording the audio of our program. Thank you to Fada for helping in social media, show descriptions, and so many other ways over on that YouTube chat room for sure. And I would love to give a shout out. Fada told me that Wall Street Tech on YouTube gave us a donation over there on YouTube. Thank you for that. That was amazing, Wall Street Tech. Really appreciated. And now I would love to thank our Patreon sponsors. Thank you to Paul Disney, Ed Dyer, Andrew Swanson, Craig Landon, Andy Grow, Ed, Stu Pollock, Philip Shane, Ken Hayes, Harrison Prather, Charlene Henry, Joshua Fury, Steve DeBell, Alex Wilson, Tony Steele, Richard Porter, Mark Mazaros, Jack Matthew Litwin, Jason Roberts, Bill Kay, Bob Calder, Patrick Cohn, Eric Knapp, Richard, Brian Condren, Dave Neighbor, Her- Howard Tan, Gome Kay, Donald Mundus, Sarah Forfar, Dan Kay, Matt Bass, Darwin Hannon, Part Patrick Pecoraro, Ben Bignell, Jean Tellier, John, Gr- John Gridley, Corinne Ben. Adam LaJoy, Sarah Chavis, Rodney Lewis, Tiffany Boyd, John Bertram, Mountain Sloth, Seth O'Gradney, Stefan Alberon, John Ratnaswamy, Dave Friedel, Daryl Myshak, Paul Ronovich, Sue Doster, Dave Wilkinson, Noodles, Kevin Reardon, Christoph Zuknarek, Ashish Pants, Ulysses Adkins, Artie Rick Ramis, Paul, John McKee, Jason Olds, Brian Carrington, Rich, Christopher Dreyer, Lisa Slazuski, Jim Drapeau, Greg Riley, Sean Lamb, Steve Leesman, Kurt Larson, Rudy Garcia, Marjorie, Gary S., Robert, Greg Briggs, Brenda Minish, Christopher Rappin, Flying Out, Aaron Luthen, Matt Sutter, Mark Hessenflo, Kevin Parachan, Byron Lee, and E.O. Thank you for all of your support on Patreon. If you are interested in supporting us, you can find information at the Patreon link at twist.org or go directly to patreon.com slash thisweekinscience. Also remember, you can help us out simply by telling your friends about Twist. On next week's show, we will be joined by computer scientist Melanie Mitchell to discuss her book, Artificial Intelligence, A Guide for Thinking Humans. Once again... We're going to be broadcasting live online at 8 p.m. Pacific time, Wednesday evening. Twist.org slash live is where you can find us or on YouTube or Facebook. Watch live. Join our chat rooms. Don't worry if you can't make it, though. Past episodes will always be available at YouTube or twist.org. Thank you very much for enjoying the show. Twist is also available as a podcast. Just Google This Week in Science anywhere, and we'll probably pull right up with the podcast or other links to ways you can listen to the show. That's right. And if you'd like information on anything you may have heard here today, show notes are available on our website. That's at www.twist.org. That's T-W-I-S.org, where you can also make comments and start conversations with the hosts and other listeners. Or you can contact us directly. Email Kirsten at Kirsten at thisweekinscience.com, Justin at twistminion at gmail.com, or Blair at blairbaz at twist.org. Just be sure to put twist, T-W-I-S, somewhere in the subject line. Otherwise, what will happen to your email? Your email will be spam filtered into oblivion. You can also hit us up on the Twitter where we are at Twist Science, at Dr. Kiki, at Jackson Fly, and at Blair's Menagerie. We love your feedback. If there's a topic you'd like us to cover or address, a suggestion for an interview, a haiku that comes to you in the night, please let us know. We'll be back here next week, and we hope you'll join us again for more great science news. And if you've learned anything from the show, remember they think may have eventually led to larger brains and what is that what you remember no it's all in your head this week in science this week in science this week in science This week in science, it's the end of the world. So I'm setting up shop, got my banner unfurled. It says the scientist is in, I'm gonna sell my advice. Show them how to stop the robots with a simple device. I'll reverse global warming with a wave of my hand. And all it'll cost you is a couple of grand. Cause this week's science is coming your way. So everybody listen to what I say. I use the scientific method for all the
that it's worth And I'll broadcast my opinion all over the earth Cause it's this week in science This week in science This week in science Science, science, science. science. This week in science This week in science this week in science, 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 I've got one disclaimer and it shouldn't be news That what I say may not represent your views But I've done the calculations and I've got a plan If you listen to the science you may just yet understand That we're not trying to threaten your philosophy We're just trying to save the world from jeopardy, jeopardy, jeopardy. And this week in science is coming away so everybody listen to everything we say And if you use our methods instead of rolling a die We may rid the world of toxoplasma Gandhi, aye, 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 aye. Cause it's this week in science This week in science This week in science Science, 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 science. This week in science This week in science This week in science Science, 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 science. Got a laundry list of items I want to address From stopping global hunger to dredging Loch Ness I'm trying to promote more rational thought And I'll try to answer any question you've got But how can I ever see the changes I seek When I can only set up shop one hour a week This week in science is coming your way you better just listen to what we say And if you've learned anything from the words that we've said Then please just remember it's all in your head Cause it's this week in science This week in science This week in science Science, 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 science. This week in science This week in science This week in science Science, 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 science. science. This week in science this week in science, 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 this week in science. And we have come to the end of another show, another episode. We've got to go. Well, maybe not right away, but pretty soon Blair's going to have to run away. She has some things to do. Justin said he'd be right back. I don't know where he went. Well, Justin would be thrilled to know that I have to go uh, take care of a dog and two cats. <laughs> Justin and his cat problems. I think he must have cat trauma from his childhood or something. Maybe. Or, something. or he always wanted a cat and he, he won't admit it. <laughs> I think maybe that's what it is. He really, we should get him a cat. No. <laughs> yeah. Let's send him a cat. That'll go great. Oh, Justin, your housewarming present. I got you a kitten. I got you a cat. <laughs> <laughs> well, that would be funny. So apparently we streamed to Facebook and we streamed to YouTube this evening and to our twist.org website which is great look at all our multi-streaming awesome identity four can you get a cat identity four says identity four would like a cat i would like a dog identity four will maybe be owning a house soon and could have a cat if you own a house will that happen allergies cat vaccine well, vaccine Cat vaccine, see? Or just be miserable for a few years and you might develop an immunity. It depends on the level of the allergy, but yeah. yeah. I have, a, I, yeah, sometimes with some cats I have a little bit of an allergy, but I live with cats. I grew up with cats. It depends on the cats. So I have some questions if you have a minute here. So I... Go. I'm done with the art for the calendar. And so this weekend I'm starting to put the final touches on it, which means 
um, putting holidays and things down mm -hmm. for the next year, which means planning our next year. So question number one, are we doing a show on New Year's Day? Oh, dear. These are the big questions that yes. need to be determined and debated. And yes. or, or would we do it? Uh, where are my calendars? I don't have my calendars right here with me right now. Hmm. Hot Rod, it's not New Year's Eve. It's New Year's Day. Uh, eight o'clock at night on New Year's Day. Yeah, doesn't sound like a stretch. Yes, that sounds does. doable. Kiki's concerned. I have mm -hmm. concerns. I have concerns. Possibly doable. I do not know. So uh, can you okay. can you Let can me... you put the show in the calendar with an asterisk? <laughs> no. <laughs> It's the very first episode that we would be advertising for the year. I'd like to just do it or not. Right. I feel like it I think sense. I feel like it's easy to also just say no if mm -hmm. that's what needs to happen, but I don't think anyone will be too upset with us that we're missing the show on New Year's Day, but um I can also do it. So I yes. don't so I don't think of New Year's Day as being uh, special or a holiday. I mean, it can be a day of recovery for some, uh, but by the time you get to eight o'clock at night, maybe it's time to jump back into the, the science. Do you have this year's calendar? This is what we have to do. So the year in review show, is that uh -huh. the 18th? December 18th and it's then are we taking far the away from me right now that's mine's far away from me too so okay so this is our this is our I can tell you homework if you give me one second one second hold on we I'm can looking. do homework we don't have to decide yeah, right uh, now I what, need what to find out is whether Christmas day is there a show yeah so it's Christmas day and New Year's Day this year mm-hmm so the the issue here is wow, which also means it will be uh, my birthday. Uh, okay, the week prior, yeah. Our our year in review is birthday. the eighteenth. Yeah. Okay. That's and, what it says on the calendar. Yes, and yeah. there's no show on the twenty fifth. We already decided. Okay. Yeah. So then our prediction show. Yes. Would be when. Well, so there is this secret menu option of us doing a different Day. recording somewhere in the pocket between Christmas and New Year's Day <laughs> that is a prediction show, and then we'd be back to the normal schedule on the 8th. That is an option. Because we could, we could, yeah, we could do a secret show in the middle that we could put up. Mm -hmm. It wouldn't be, it would be a secret show. Mm -hmm. I guess I guess a Christmas Day Eve show would, I, I wouldn't even have, but we've, I guess we decided not to do that one. Yeah, we're not yeah, doing Christmas not. Day. Right. We're going to take a day off. It's okay. I, I do things with family and I go places and I don't know, I'm going to be traveling probably, maybe. I mean, I could be here. I don't know, but I don't have that planned at this point because my family doesn't talk to each other until the last minute. And then everybody's like, chickens, blah, where are we going? What's happening? Yeah. Well, and I mean, whether you celebrate it or not, it's a holiday in the United States. And so yes. I'm off of work and I have the opportunity to be with family, which yeah. is lovely. So yeah. I will take that opportunity up. And that's I think that's great. I'm down. Okay. I think it's okay. To so if that. that's the case, then I think we definitely do the show on the first. Definitely. You can't, can't take, take two weeks week off. off. There's, there's no way. Well, yeah, I think if we did that, we'd have to do a different show somewhere in the middle. I mean, yeah, I, we could we could do a pickup show for mm -hmm. predictions, or we could do the prediction show mm -hmm. on the first. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, so we don't you have to like really distract you. Like, no, the the holidays. It's just I never, I honestly never know 
where we're going to be. I, I don't know what, and I don't know what my plans are going to be. And I need, this is, this is my, this is my reminder. I need to figure this out mm -hmm. ASAP. And because if it's the kind of thing where I'm like, oh, I can take some time and go, mm -hmm. you know, take my computer over to this corner and do a show, that's fine. But if it's a situation where that's not possible, um, you know, yeah, I need, I need to work that out. And the show comes before family. <laughs> this has um, always been. You're my family. All of you are my family. This has always been show first, family, <laughs> if you can fit it in in the rest of the week. Um, and noodles, so it would be a, it would be a hangover twist for me, most yeah. likely. I, I think that the, the other <laughs> I'm just, issue, I'm right, just putting is, it out there. Is that it would New just Year's be a twist Day, me, yeah. New Year's Day, whether or I, not like I we're super late. busy, it's a national holiday. So national that means holiday. a lot of people aren't working or in school or wherever, and so yeah. I do feel like that creates a wrinkle. Um, but so let me let me just tell you the way the holiday works this year also it's like the way it all works we don't have to be back at school for kai until the 6th mm -hmm. of january he has he ha i think he's got off of school until january 6th and so this is like right in the middle of potential holiday time I don't know where I'm going to be. And I need, I mean, obviously I'm not going, I don't know. Maybe I'll be in Denmark <laughs> or in the woods. <laughs> in the, me, I'm in the woods. I like the woods. Um, okay. So <laughs> how about this? Um, when, uh, I'm just trying to figure out for production of this thing. I feel like I need to know probably by next week. Okay. Um, I can other... do that. I can do that. Okay. The other thing I was looking at was our trip to Seattle. We're still yes. doing a show on either side of that. Of course. Okay. I'm just checking. Yes. Okay. Well, yeah. Cause the, yeah, these are special extra mm -hmm. things that may not be broadcast. Right. So I just wanted yeah. to confirm that. And I think those are the only big potential things is that because uh, all the other holidays aren't on a Wednesday. I was just looking. So I think we're pretty okay. golden after that. For the, the rest of 2020. Yeah. Um, and then I just have to go through one by one and check the animal holidays. <laughs> Make sure the animal holidays match up still, because oh sometimes God. things change. I know, and I check it every year, and then somehow some other calendar says a different date regardless. Like, I don't know who's deciding the animal days, but somehow then, somebody yeah. always changes it up. I'm like, ah, why did you do that? There's well, also... There's four think, different Arbor Days, depending on the country you're in as well, for example. Uh, yeah. <laughs> and some some of them are like days that people have made up and they're not completely recognized, mm -hmm. really recognized yet. And so then you have to be like, oh, is this a really real one or is it not a real one? Is this one that's going to last more than two years? Um, Thunder Beaver says, when are we going to Seattle for twists? We are going to Seattle for twists. We're going to be at the AAAS, the American Association for the Advancement of Science meeting. It's around Valentine's Day. So February 14th through 17th, 16th. Something yeah. like that. Yeah. For I will probably be heading up. I would probably be heading up to Seattle on Thursday. Mm -hmm. So editing the podcast for that week, the 12th, that's going to be fun. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but it'll be a fun weekend. It'll be mm -hmm. science weekend. Yeah. And uh, Blair and Justin, you both should register for press registration mm. I think I have to I have to turn in a form but and get all the details but I'll, I'll send you details on that Great. so that you know what to do for the conference Great. but um, I have registered as press in the past and that is um, 
it's good. Yeah, um, I went with you in San Jose. Yes, that's right. It was very fun. Yeah, you did that. You both did. Did did you do it, get that, Justin? I don't think Justin No, you didn't came. come to San Jose that year. Okay. But I got a press pass and I got so excited. <laughs> like, oh my God, I'm press. Oh my God, yes. <laughs> this is exciting. You can impress people. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Oh, Hot Rod. Look at you thinking. We could broadcast old Twist episodes on Twist's YouTube 24-7 when not live. I wonder how, yeah. Or we should. We could just do that on Twitch. Mm -hmm. <laughs> just yeah. <let> every... <laughs> That'd be good. The people would be like, are you live now? No, this is from 13 years ago. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, yeah, that's fun. Yes, Thunder Beaver, that's the meeting that we're going to. I I haven't looked at the details, so I actually don't know many of them. I still probably have to reserve hotel and do all the mm -hmm. fun things, mm -hmm. make all the contingencies. Let's just get a really fun Airbnb where we can all stay. <laughs> that would be fun. I mean, I, it is, yeah. I'm in it's, favor of that because then you have like common space and yeah, it's nice. A fridge. <laughs> nice thing. But, you know, there's nice things about having a hotel room. There's nice things about having an Airbnb, you know? Yeah. Uh, nice I'm things always about in favor things. of proximity to the event. Mm -hmm. I am so. in favor of that as well. Getting to and from is important to me. I yeah. like being able to be like, I'm here and now I'm sleeping. Yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. Oh, look how I walked up. Oh, an elevator? Fantastic. There's my bed. Yeah. Uh, the ideal was uh, Denver, where the hotel mm -hmm. room, I could look down and see the venue. That was mm -hmm. pretty rad. That was great. Yeah. Especially because. And it was, it was also cool. downtown. So there was stumbly distance to all sorts of fun things. Yeah. Yeah. yeah Denver was cool. Seattle be a, Seattle be a lot of fun. That'll yeah. be good. I'm excited. Yeah. All right. Um, okay, there's Seattle. One week for me to give you a yes or no on a New Year's Day show. Yeah. Tick tock, tick tock, tick tock, tick. And then that also means by next week, I hope to have everything else ironed out and the calendar is ready for you to look at. Okay. Awesome. You overloaded yet? No. <laughs> I'm just going to sit here and pinch my face. <laughs> yeah. Everything's fine. I did it to myself. I do these things to myself. Every year. Yeah. Like, let me do this again. Well, especially this year, I think this is the most complicated process I've ever given myself. So um, if anyone's curious and didn't get the newsletter. That's right. I can there send There is the newsletter. I explained my processes in the newsletter. That's There's a newsletter? Yep. Huh? Oh, that's right. Identity 4 will have us. We're all staying at Identity 4's house. No. Perfect. Yeah. <laughs> um, in the next newsletter, I'll probably write about my trip. Yeah. Oh, we still have. Yes. Good trip. You got to write a good trip story for the newsletter. Yeah. Yeah. I'll work on that maybe in two weeks. That sounds good. One Perfect. thing at a time. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. Justin, how's Denmark? Uh, you know, uh, absolutely nothing rotten about it. Not a thing. Good. Yeah, it's pretty amazing. Nothing rotten in the state of Denmark. Cool. Have you been on adventures? Uh, not a whole lot. Uh, it also rains a lot here. Uh, yeah. There's some interesting things. Uh, one thing that's, I know it's not, it's completely unique to this country, uh, but they, but they do have, all the toilets have the two buttons. Uh -huh. Like all of them have the two. One that was in the, Canada too. Yeah. They were the all, all there. Half flush and then the full flush button on the toilets. I find that like a thing that is missing. Uh, it's dumb that it's missing for us. Yeah. I don't understand why. I mean, easy. 
in Israel, when I lived there, the t the toilets from the 1970s and 80s had the two flushes because it's a desert, so they have to conserve water. Yeah. Uh, the largest cars on the roads uh, are compact cars. Mm -hmm. Almost all of the cars are subcompacts. That's, that's, that's a very noticeable thing. That's yeah. fun. Um, it's because it's shorter distances between cities. I mean, you don't need as big a car if you're not going as far. Yeah. Uh, recycling. <laughs> Tinier uh, roads probably too. Smaller roads. You got to fit them on the roads. They have recycling <laughs> machines that uh, scan the barcode of your recyclables. So you just, it's this little conveyor belt. You just put them on. It reads it, spins it and reads the thing. And you, so you just put in all your bottles and cans or containers or whatever through this thing. It <laughs> scans them and then it uh, pops out a receipt for your recycling wow. that you then go take up to the rest. And you can find these at any grocery store anywhere. They're like all over the place. It's very cool. You mean you don't have to drive like several miles to go find the recycling place where you can go <laughs> trade in? No, but I mean, uh, people do, uh, people trade in their recycling, uh, which is, a, is a, as opposed to like, I don't know, where I'm at in the United States, you have a recycling bin that you throw everything to. And Curbside. And takes it and yeah. Recycles it. But I, I grew up turning in our recycling. We would collect like bags and bags and bags of stuff. But we, we lived out in the country, so we had to drive like 20 miles to go to the nearest recycling center. And so it was like we'd collect a lot of it and like fill up my dad's truck. And it was like there's always this big deal to go to the recycling mm. place. So it's interesting to think of it on a, I guess, a more kind of weekly scale where you're like, yeah. oh, I have my little bag and I'm going to take yeah. it over. And, you go yeah. shopping, you bring your recycling bag with you. You throw your recycling and it gives you a credit towards uh, the, the shopping. I thought that was pretty good. Um, <laughs> yeah. Uh, it rains a lot and it is foggy a lot and there is a considerable amount of wind. So they're putting the turbines in the right country. Nice. Yeah, good. More turbines. How much longer are you going to be there? You have a clue. Uh, I'm coming back forever uh, for, for a little bit. <laughs> coming back for a little bit at the end of this month, and then you uh, are going back to the states at the end of this month, and then coming back again, and going back at the end of the month, and coming back again, and then I should be uh, I should be stateside for the holidays for the christmas the new year's wow you're going back and forth you're a little you're a jet setter look at you well for, for <laughs> yeah for right now yeah yeah this is a good all change oh my goodness. that's awesome all right that's super fun okay blair i know you need to take off justin you have go have an adventure do. are you gonna have do you have a day planned uh today not not so much uh more for the weekend nice okay yeah. say good night blair good night blair say good night justin can't say good morning justin say good morning. morning justin okay good, good night, night Kiki. Kiki. good night everyone good morning justin I hope everyone has a wonderful week ahead and that we see you again next week for more science. Woohoo! Have some good adventures out there, everyone.